But let me tell you this, this stuff can be learned. And it actually makes sense and can be fun too, you know, when you get into it. Um, so, all right. Um, so, just a few interesting did you know facts. So, the average tax refund is almost $3,000. Can you believe that? That's a lot of money that the government is holding on to during the year that all of you are entitled to. Maybe not $3,000, but, you know, potentially a refund. Um, now, these days, e-filing is typically done to file tax returns. Back in the day when I was coming up through the system, we paper filed because the IRS wasn't quite yet technologically, technologically savvy. Um, you know, the other interesting thing is that with all of these refunds, a lot of times taxpayers don't actually claim their money. They just give it up to the government. You know, either they have withholding done and don't file tax returns to actually claim that money back, or they just don't cash checks or claim their money. So when we file your tax returns, it's very important to actually get those checks and deposit them. So that's good money. All right, so the first topic that we wanted to discuss is how do you file your tax return? And so, as you can imagine here, we can file tax returns on paper, or we can actually e-file. And so, right now, you know, both systems are generally free for federal. Um, you know, you can complete your tax return and mail it in to the specified address, which is right in the 1040 instructions, or you can actually go online and e-file. The nice thing about e-filing is that, first, you don't have to pay for postage, the second thing is that pretty quickly, the IRS will send you an email saying whether your return was accepted or rejected. So that's immediate confirmation, so that's pretty nice. So you don't have to worry about whether the IRS actually received your returns or whether the post system just lost your tax returns. Um, you know, we mentioned before that a lot of people get refunds, but if by chance you actually owe taxes, then you can pay by check. If you, you know, paper file, you can attach a check with your mailing. Or there's actually a section on the 1040 to include your bank account information. And if you put both your, it's the routing number, which tells the IRS what bank you use. And then if you also include your checking account or savings account information, then the IRS will actually automatically take money from your account. Um, as you might know, the due dates for 1040s is April 15th. It's often known as tax day. It's a day that makes both of us very happy as our tax season is over them. Um, now, a lot of times people can't complete their tax returns on time, so they extend their tax returns. And the extended due date is October 15th. There's a six month extension. Now, the one very important thing to keep in mind is that the IRS permits taxpayers to extend tax returns, but not to extend the payment of tax. Right? Because the IRS still wants all of their money by April 15th. So what people have to do then is estimate what their tax liabilities might be by April 15th and pay that in to the IRS on an extension form and then later over the summer complete their actual filing and claim that extension payment almost like a credit on their return. And then if there's any difference due, then they pay in at that time and then probably have a little bit of interest and penalty since they're late. So if you want to extend your returns for some reason, make sure that you have enough information to actually pay in if you think you'll pay, you have to pay. Or if you're due a refund, just send in the extension and you don't have to do anything else until you actually file. You have to file a tax return if your gross income is over $10,000 if you're single or $20,000 if you're filing married filing joint. So generally there are three federal forms that you can choose to file your tax return. And how we've laid this out is from the simplest to, I wouldn't call it the most complex, but the full-on form. So here to the left, we have the 1040EZ. And this is a watered-down version of the full 1040. And the reason for that is because a lot of the lines aren't there, right? And so a lot of students might like the 1040EZ because if you don't have that much going on with your personal tax situation, then you don't need to go through the entire 1040 and fill out all of the different lines because most of it probably won't be applicable to you. The 1040A, I personally actually never even completed the 1040A. I don't know no. if you have, Danielle. Mm -hmm. So the 1040A is like a hybrid of the 1040EZ and the 1040 in that it can accommodate more situations than the 1040EZ, but not as many as the 1040. So in my experience, people either do the 1040 EZ or just the 1040. There's four options for you. You can either be single, um, you can be head of household, married filing jointly, or married filing separately. 
if you for what if you're married but divorced you have to you cannot file single if you're legally married um, head of household is for people who have a qualifying child or relative as a dependent on their return and they pay more than half of the expenses for keeping the house up and the expenses for taking care of that person um, they get a little bit more of a deduction for that kind of thing head of household is a little harder to qualify for so if you think that you might qualify read through the rules um, generally it's a single person who has people living with them that they're paying for and taking care of and that doesn't count if you have roommates you wouldn't be head of household <laughs> um, Married filing jointly is what it sounds. You're married, you're both going to file on the same return. And then married filing separately is that you're married and you file two separate 1040s. Um, there's a couple reasons for this. Uh, one would be if you don't want to have joint liability for your spouse, if you think that they're doing some shady things on their tax return, you don't want to get in trouble if they do. Um, you laugh, but it happens. <laughs> and uh, so then you would want to consider married filing separately. Uh, some of my high net worth clients file separately because they marry somebody who doesn't have the income. Sometimes a prenup agreement requires you to file separately. Um, so just those kinds of things. Also, another consideration is there's some of the deductions that we're going to go through. They're, they're subject to AGI limits, which is your adjusted gross income. So if one spouse doesn't have a lot of income, but they have a lot of medical expenses which are subject to this limit, you might, that spouse might want to file separately from the other one to get the full benefit. But in general, married filing separately is not at all beneficial. So where do you file if you live in one state and work in another? So if you are a student being claimed as a dependent on your parents' return, your resident state is generally where your parents live. And you file your resident state, that's where your income gets taxed to. Um, so if you are from New York and you're going to school here, you have a job here, DC will still want to tax your income. So they, you will still have to file a DC non-resident return. And then New York, because you're a resident of their state, is going to want to tax that same income. So that kind of sounds like something's not right, you're getting taxed on the income twice. So most states have a form where you can file for a credit for taxes paid to another state. So your income earned here in DC as a student, you would be, you'd file your DC return and then report that on your New York return that this much of income was taxed by DC and this is the tax I paid to DC and New York would give you a credit for that that would then reduce your New York liability. A lot of states have reciprocity agreements which in this area it's very common where if you live in DC, you work in Maryland, you don't have to file a Maryland return because DC is your resident state. You can tell your employer in Maryland, don't withhold Maryland taxes, withhold DC taxes because that's where it's going to get taxed. In other states, I know that in Illinois, they have that with um, Michigan and Wisconsin because they, it's common in areas where there's cross-border commuting in the New, New York, Connecticut, New Jersey area here with DC, Virginia, Maryland. Uh, Maryland has it with a lot of states actually, like West Virginia as well and Pennsylvania. Um, so look into that, but if you had withholding from a state, the state where you work in, even if you don't have to file a return to report the income to that, you'd want to file a return to get that withholding returned to you. So exemptions, this is what you were talking about earlier. Um, each person that's claimed on a return is considered an exemption. So if a family of four is filing, married filing joint, they have two kids, there's generally four exemptions on that return. The kids are dependents, Let's say they're seven and ten. Um, so this is where it comes into play. If you're a dependent on somebody else's return, you cannot claim an exemption for yourself. Your parents are getting that exemption. And again, the exemption, it's $3,900. And it's not a credit, it's, it reduces your taxable income. Um, so it just makes it the base that they're paying tax on lower. Um, so when you start a job, you usually have to fill out a W-4 form. And before I was in a, when I was still living with my parents in high school, I had a job. My dad said, just put all zeros because on my tax return, I'm claiming zero exemption. So all zeros, it means that they don't withhold, they withhold the most tax with, yes. The lower the number, the more tax they withhold because your income isn't going to be reduced by the exemption. So 
it doesn't have to match your tax return. It's just giving them a guideline. So if I, now I have one exemption. If I wanted them to withhold more money so I got a refund when I filed my tax return, I would put zero. I have some friends who hate the idea of the government holding on to their money from withholding longer than needed. So they are one person and they put down three. And sometimes that means that they owe with their tax return. They're completely okay with that because the government didn't have their money for that time period. Um, and so if you put more exemptions on your W-4 than you claim on your tax return, that's again, they don't withhold as much. So you might owe. A lot of people, when you get a refund, it is exciting. And it is kind, it is free money, but it is your money. Because when you earn the money, they withhold taxes out of it. So you're just getting your money back when you file a return and get a refund. And if you file a return and owe it, yeah, that sucks. But you had that money the whole time because they didn't take out as much in withholding. So who would be an exemption? You can either, a child or sometimes relatives can qualify. Um, we talked earlier about students, if you're 24 or less and then your parents provide more than half of your support. Um, the living with them for the entire year, this kind of goes with the uh, temporary absence from the home. Even though you're not physically living in your parents' home, you're, you can still be considered a dependent while a student. And you can't be married if you're a dependent. And relatives are similar. You provide more than half of their support. Um, for this, it's the $3,900 It goes with that exemption amount. So if they make less than the exemption, they can be, if they have some type of job, make $10,000, we'll say $8,000 a year, they can't be a dependent. Um, and they have to live with you. All right, so we're going to talk about income now. And we have some common income types for students, but we can definitely talk about other income types if you guys have questions. So the first one we have on here is wage income which is generally reported on a form W-2. And so this is something, just like we've been talking about, it has a lot of different boxes on it. And if you work for a company, you'll receive this W-2 form typically by the end of January of the following year. And it'll have all of your gross income that you earn from the company, plus the withholding that was sent to both the IRS and your state, if applicable, and some other numbers on there as well. And the other numbers are really for payroll taxes. So in the US, we have a system where we have to pay into Social Security. And so anyone who works has to pay in. And so all of the other numbers on your W-2 relate to that. But for income tax purposes, you want to pay attention to the first box, which is your wages for federal purposes, the second box, which is your federal withholding, and then the box is right on the bottom that Danielle referenced for your states. Interest is another common form of income, and so here, if you have some cash because you, let's say, worked over the summer and have some additional cash that you have sitting in your bank account, and your bank account is interest earning, then at the end of the year, you might have some additional income or cash in your account that relates to that interest that you earned. Well, that's taxable. And so if you have an amount over $10 for the year, then the bank should send you a 1099 form. So it's 1099-INT for interest. And on that form, it should tell you with your name, you know, all of your information on it, and box one will show you your interest income that you earned during the year. So that's something that you want to pick up on your return. So similarly, dividends, right? So let's say that you worked for Google, you know, you had some type of summer internship or, you know, with IBM or anything like that, and as part of the internship, you were given some stock. And because you have this corporate stock now, Sometimes the corporations will actually issue you dividends, right? So a dividend is a return on your you know, investment in the corporation. And so at the end of the year, the company should give you a 1099 DIV for a dividend. And that's also something that you want to report on your return. There's something called an ordinary dividend and a qualified dividend. And on your 1099 DIV, it'll specify what your dividend is. So there's box 1A and 1B or something like that. Is that right? whatever, two boxes, one for ordinary, one for qualified. The important thing is that qualified dividends are afforded a reduced tax rate. And sometimes for taxpayers that have, that have income under certain thresholds, the tax rate's actually zero for qualified dividends. Um, and this was, the, the differentiation is that domestic corporations will generate or will pay out qualified dividends, but foreign corporations 
often pay out ordinary dividends, which is taxed at a higher rate. So that was the IRS's way to incentivize taxpayers to invest in domestic corporations. So it's a little bit of tax policy mixed in with tax law. Scholarships and grants not used for tuition. So we touched upon this briefly before, but this is you know, a hot topic here with students. And so, again, like we mentioned, if your scholarships and, tu and um, grants are used to pay tuition and books and fees and that type of thing, it's not included in income. So you don't have to report it, I think, right? Or do you have to report it, take it out? You don't have to report it. Yeah. It depends, on, it depends on if you get a form reporting that to you. But generally, you don't have to report it. Yeah. Now, if you use that money for personal expenses or something like that, then that would be taxable. Because at that point, that's almost like free money to you to be used at your discretion. Um, tips, gambling income. Mm -hmm. Tips may be for people who work you know, in the restaurant business or the service business. That's reported. Gambling income, you know, hopefully there isn't too much of that. Um, although Linux City is not too far away. Um, Self-employment income. So this was a, a question that we had earlier. So Danielle referenced the Schedule C. And so what happens here if you earn money? So let's say that you're some type of independent contractor, right? And you work for a company. And you receive income through this 1099 that you receive. That income generally will not have any withholding on it. Right? Because the withholding takes place when you have an employer-employee uh, relationship. But if you're an independent contractor, then you are being hired to do you know, whatever you've been hired for. And so there, um, typically there isn't any withholding, and you have to report that income on the special form, Schedule C. And there, you also itemize all of your deductions that you incurred as part of earning that income. So if you earned $5,000 of income, but you also had travel expenses to get to your job, or if you had you know, insurance that you needed, or if you had you know, anything like that related to earning that income, you can deduct that, since so it's almost like a business. Another example of Schedule C is when I was in college, I babysat a lot to earn my income. So I filed a Schedule C reporting that even though I didn't get a 1099 from any of the parents, they just paid me. So it was my responsibility to keep track of that income throughout the year. And then like if I bought like craft supplies or things to do with the kids, I could all, like take that as a deduction on Schedule C. But um, any income that you're earning, even if you're not receiving a 1099, like tips, babysitting money, if you walk dogs, anything like that, should be reported on your 1040. Again, they don't have any way of really checking that. It's the honor system. Um, sometimes, this probably wouldn't happen to you guys, but the IRS could see that you have large quantities of money in your bank account, but you're not reporting any money on your tax return. They could audit you and say, where is all this money coming from? So then, we talked about a lot of gross income items, but there are some things that reduce gross income. And these are adjustments to gross income. And so, like we mentioned in the beginning, the 1040EZ is very limited with the lines that it provides. And so on this 1040EZ, you can't make any adjustments. So if you have adjustments, file the 1040. Um, so on the 1040, some common deductions for students relates to an IRA contributions deduction. And so here, you can actually contribute to an IRA, not a Roth, but to a regular traditional IRA. And if your income is under certain limits, then you can actually get a deduction. So that's another reason to start contributing to your retirement plans because you can actually get a tax deduction today for that. Um, we talked about student loan interest, so you can deduct up to $2,500. And um, this is again on the 1040. And educational expenses. Um, there's also another adjustment on page one. This is, again, adjustments to gross income on page one of your 1040 for these types of expenses. Um, so this, the standard deduction, deduction versus itemizing deductions, again, a deduction just reduces your taxable income. Uh, the standard deduction for single people is $6,100. Um, so just for filing a tax return, your income is reduced by $6,100. You also have the option to itemize your deductions. A lot of young people don't do this, depending on how much money you make. Um, because in order for it to be beneficial, you'd have to have more than $6,100 of itemized deductions. Otherwise, you would just take the standard one that they give you because it's higher. Um, some common itemized deductions are state taxes paid. So on your W-2, that withholding amount, those are taxes paid to your state. Um, in Virginia, if you have a car, a lot of times you'll have to pay a personal property tax. That can be an itemized deduction. 
Um, if you own a home, your property taxes and any mortgage interest that you pay on your mortgage. Um, any charitable contributions are also an itemized deduction. And then your tax preparation fees are an itemized deduction, but that's one of those things that's subject to a limit on your adjusted gross income. So you wouldn't be able to deduct all of them. So we kind of touched on this earlier about your tax, tax due versus your taxes paid. Um, so if you have excess, you'll be getting a refund, and that just means that you had more withholding than the taxes. Bless you. Um, so that uh, you can either get the money refunded to you or the credit carry forward means that if next year you know you're going to have a lot of income and you don't think enough will be withheld, you can apply that refund to next year's taxes. Um, generally, wage employees who get W-2s don't do that because their withholding is generally sufficient. Um, but if you know that you're going to sell a lot of stock at a gain next year and there's not withholding on that when you sell it, then you might want to apply it. Um, if there's a shortfall, you have to pay what you owe. You can send in a check with a payment voucher with your return. They accept money orders at the IRS, and you can also go online and pay with a credit or debit card. Um, there is a fee associated with the credit card option, though. Um, and if you can't pay, you can make an agreement with the IRS for installment payments to get to that amount, um, or you could request for an extension to pay. Um, but those are all things you'd have to contact the IRS about. And don't forget to sign your return. A lot of times people, for, if you're e-filing, that doesn't, not an issue, but if you're paper filing, don't forget to sign it.